I want to thank Suzanne Keenis brown for being here to support our webinar and introduce our presenter. Suzanne, I'm going to turn the webinar over to you so you can introduce the topic and our presenter. Thank you, Sean. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks for calling in today in the second of a series of DSM-focused webinars. So today it's my pleasure to introduce Betsy Shug. She is a soil scientist in St. Paul, Minnesota. Betsy is an up-and-coming DSM rock star, and she's involved in the focus team in both the project mentoring and as an instructor for some training courses. Um, I'm really excited for everybody to hear about her project today. Um, this is a great project where she used some uh, creative ways to combine different approaches to digital soil mapping to reach her project goals and publish a raster soil survey. So with that, Betsy, I'll turn it over to you and let us all right, let you tell, tell us what you did. All right. Well, uh, thanks for that introduction, Suzanne. Um, like you said, my name is Betsy Shug. I am a field soil scientist located at the regional office in St. Paul, Minnesota. And right now, I'm actually giving this presentation while attending the Wisconsin Soil Scientist Meeting in the beautiful Northwoods just outside Rhinelander, Wisconsin. So, okay. So this presentation is titled MLRA 90A, Mille Lacs Uplands Coarse Loamy Basal Till Investigation, a Quantitative and Knowledge-Based Approach to Reconcile Initial and Updated Soil Surveys. And just a little side note about this, um, this was a really neat project to kind of sink my teeth in. Um, it had its challenges, which I thought were um, a really interesting thing to tackle. And needless to say, once this was all said and done, it was an awesome feeling to know that a project like this was doable and we accomplished it, and it's a project that I think um, we can be really proud of. All right, so this project took place in East Central Minnesota and included two soil catenas, as well as organic and alluvial soils, that spanned approximately 1.2 million acres in nine counties in dominantly private-held land. Um, the goal of this project was to update the current Sergo project and complete a portion of a county that did not have any available digital soils information while also producing a raster soil survey that would complement a new updated Sergo product. This would be done using the latest available digital soil mapping technology and by following guidance from the National Soil Survey Handbook, Soil Survey Manual, and the Regional Office. For delivering the raster and Sergo products, the objectives were to reconcile legacy correlation issues, evaluate trends across the geomorphic surface, and to develop a raster-based soil survey product using the latest DSM technology to augment both consistency and efficiency that would complement a Sergo product. So a little background about the glacial geology in the project area. Um, the soils were deposited during the late Wisconsin glaciation by the superior lobe. These soils tended to be coarse loamy alpha soils with densic contact below 100 centimeters. As the superior lobe was receding, the Grantsburg sublobe of the Des Moines was setting up camp just south of the project area. This sublobe dammed up meltwater from the receding superior lobe, creating Glacial Lake Grantsburg. Well, once Glacial Lake Grantsburg receded, or excuse me, drained, the hypothesis is, is that the silt and very fine sandy loam materials from that glacial lake bed were windblown in a northwesterly direction and draped across the superior sediments. The superior sediments that had the silty mantle presence were members of the Brennyville Catena, and the sediments that lacked the silty, melt, silty mantle were members of the Malacca Catena. Both these catenas are coarse, loamy glossidol. All right, so this entire 1.2 million acre project actually had a pretty modest start as part of the initial soil survey in Pine County, Minnesota. The geomorphic area in Pine County we started with was known as the Hinkley Till Plain. One of the first data sources we looked at, besides the 1940 soil map, was a superficial glacial geology map from the Minnesota Geological Society. In addition to having that map, we also had quaternary data index documentation points that had notes and descriptions from the geologist. This was an, a useful piece of information for us to have to help us verify parent materials. 
In addition to the QDI points, we also had well depth logs from the Minnesota Department of Health, which also helped us to confirm parent material. So we used the superficial geology map to stratify the Hinkley Till Plain area, and we set out to traverse the landscape collecting documentation points with a minimum of five traverses per parent material strata. During traverse point collection, we started putting together a geo-area specific breakdown of broad observations. And based on our observations, we confirmed the area was indeed dominantly coarse loamy till with a few observations of fine loamy till. We also observed a transition in silty, parent material, in silty mantle thickness from the presence of having one in the south transitioning to not having a mantle to the north. In the Hinkley Till Plain area, we ended up collecting a total of 76 traverse points, adding to the few historical pedons we had, as well as mapping pedons from the area resource soil scientists for a total of 145 usable pedons for model training. With the 145 potential training points compiled and potential soil taxons, we were able to fine tune our broad observation guide into a usable field mapping key. Looking at the spatial location of the points we collected and their particle size control section, we could see that there was a break between dominantly coarse loamy till and dominantly fine loamy till. The area in the northern third of Hankley Till Plain was to be excluded from this project from the coarse loamy soils and included in a different project to be completed later on. So on this slide, you can see where the original Hankley Till Plain was drawn out and the hatched area represents where we refined the Hankley Till Plain to actually be. And it was at this point that we really expanded our view to include the mapping of the, to include the soils to the west. Our first intention was to actually pull the existing mapping next door into the Hinkley Till Plain. But as we investigated the soils further to the west, across the geomorphic surface, we discovered inconsistencies in historical mapping across other county lines and busts in interpretations and ratings at those lines. This is when we made the decision to expand the initial soil the initial soil survey beyond the county line and incorporate it into an MLRA update project, MLRA update project with the objective to harmonize the mapping and the data. So this slide kind of shows those county busts across that geomorphic surface. These busts can mostly be attributed to the different dates these counties were correlated, ranging from 1956 to 2009. This part of the state was also not addressed during the SGJR initiative and had over 100 individual project, project map units within this project extent. The major concerns across this geomorphic surface was the variability of surface textures, differences in map unit design and composition, and inconsistently captured soil physical properties. So with a plan to incorporate an MLRA update project, we tagged all the surgical map units to be included in the project. These would be coarse loamy alpha sols that have dense till with or without a silty mantle. That was to be our project footprint. And just like in the Hinkley Till Plain, we needed to stratify our project footprint. We chose to stratify the project area based on land use because we observed that there was a trend that showed the soils in the southwestern quarter of the project dominantly lacked a silty surface and coincided with being dominantly ag land, whereas the soils in the forested land use tended to have a silty mantle. It was also at this point that we began looking at areas to collect our training points. For areas in ag land, we actually contacted our resource soil scientist and asked him to reach out to the county DCs to help us get permissions for, from producers that they already had a relationship with. By doing this, it greatly reduced time spent trying to get permissions on our own, and it helped us to get the DCs involved in what we were trying to accomplish. Public lands used to represent for public lands were used to represent forested land use. And by choosing sampling areas based on ag and forest land use, we were able to capture the soil properties based on the dominant land use. Well, while we were waiting to get confirmation on our permissions, we poured over all the historical data in NASA and entered any previously unentered data. We ensured that all the pedons were brought up to current common standards and any data fields we thought we might need was populated. 
128 historical pedons later, we had a start on our training point. We also did a spatial check on the current mapping delineations, as well as read correlation documents to get a handle on the historical mapping concepts. By doing this, we could see that there were acceptable concepts developed between the current servo mapping and landscape position. Having confidence in the historical head-on entry, Sergo data, and knowledge of the soil characteristics as they relate to the landscape, we could begin determining our different covariates using the score pan model. Sergo mapping was also used to help determine the strongest possible covariate by performing cell statistics on the individual delineation. Physical properties that we deemed most important to modeling the soils were soil moisture class and presence or absence of the silty mantle. And using variable importance and also our knowledge as soil scientists of the landscape, the three strongest predictors for the landscape were wetness index, relative position, and slope. With our three strongest predictors chosen, we wanted to ensure that the desired training point areas were actually representative of the entire project area. Using the tools in our TUI toolbox, we compared the, cover the covariate data in the representative training point areas to the covariate data across the entire project area. And you can see here on this slide that the sampling areas we selected follow the same trends as the project area, and the desired sampling areas are indeed representative of the entire project area. For selecting training points within our permissioned areas, a stratified and model-driven sampling scheme was used. And with available staff and time, we determined that we could potentially collect 100 total training points. But not only did we want to collect the model-driven training points, but we also wanted to collect training points at both upslope and downslope positions as a way to capture the local variability of the soil. And with this sampling objective in mind, we chose to have 40 central training points, plus the additional up and downslope positions for a total of 100 training points. Using the conditioned Latin hypercube sampling method, we needed to actually run it twice, once in the agricultural land use and again in the forested land use. We also needed to collect a representative ratio of training points per land use to account for the historically underrepresented forested land use. Plot radius was also recorded at each training point as a way to document a field measure distance from the observation to the minimum distance to an observed change in soil moisture class. This was usually a morphometric transition or an observed vegetation change. These plot radius measurements would be used specifically for modeling soil moisture classes. This slide shows the amount, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the locations of all the additional training points collected, as well as traverses from the Hinkley Till Plain. Another source of training points that we were able to use were the organic soil core documentation that was collected by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. This data was collected with enough detail for us to use for modeling organics. And we ended up actually splitting out some of these DNR points to be used for validating the model later on. We were also able to identify 21 different taxons that we were going to go for modeling. With our training points collected, standardized, and entered into NASA's, we were then able to compile all that data into five different model training data sets. Each feature of interest or response variable was given a binary response of either having that property or not. These data sets each had their own function in modeling specific soil properties. For example, the first data set was our workup course. This contained all of our base data training points, such as historical, our traverse points, lab data, soil cores for the organics, and the additional points that we collected. And this data set was used for the majority of our physical soil properties. Our second data set was our training point plus the plot radius point. And again, this was to be used to predict individual soil moisture classes. Our third data set was our Minnesota DNR organic soil cores. This data set aided in developing models for mapping out our organics. The fourth data set was used to predict the probability of alluvial soils. 
And this actually used the existing surgo delineations within the project, including soils of occasional or more frequently flooding classes, as well as the adjacent histosols. Training points in these delineations were generated every 50, every 50 meters within that delineation. Our fifth data set also used existing surgo data. The existing delineations with deep histosols as a major component had training points assigned at the centroid of the delineation as that is most likely where the deep histosol would occur. And then using logistic regression in R, we were able to model all of our physical properties. This particular slide shows the results of the modeling of the soil moisture classes. And this is where we use the data set that contained our training points plus the plot radius points. So once we successfully modeled all of our physical properties in R, we began the process of tying those properties to our predictable taxons. This was going to be done in ArcSIE. One of the benefits of using both RStudio and ArcSIE is that they can be used as a way to bridge statistically driven data with our knowledge as soil scientists of where these soils occur on the landscape. And to aid in creating the rules in ArcSIE, the probability of the modeled proper property was statistically analyzed for each individual taxon. And this slide shows the probability of aqua conditions for this particular catena of soils on the left. And the image on the right is the quartile distribution of the probability of the taxons, um, of the, the probability values per taxon. And the middle is what our final rules were for that, those particular soils. Now, I didn't just treat these quartile distribution numbers as hard and fast numbers that I had to use. I merely used it as a starting point and adjusted the rules as needed to have the soils fit where I, as a soil scientist, knew they were supposed to be on the landscape. So once we had our rule sets created and we were satisfied with the modeling of the soil taxon, we performed a provisional correlation using select training points and the provisional hardened model. By doing this, we could see where certain soil taxons just didn't hold up. And this could be done to, due to limited observations, poor model discrimination, uh, limited extent in the hardened model, or just difficulty distinguishing between similar taxons. And taxons that performed poorly in the provisional correlation were noted as taxons that could be potentially recorrelated into a similar concept or just recorrelated right then and there. And some of the taxons that appeared to perform poorly were still retained, even if because the taxon had rendered a meaningful representation of a landscape associated concept that was just inherently variable across the landscape. So the field portion of our accuracy assessment, our goal was to achieve a 95% confidence level and a 10% precision level. Again, with the thought of available staff, we chose a blended sampling design to maximize efficiency and time. With the goal of collecting 90 validation points for 21 provisional taxons, we set a minimum goal of collecting five validation points per taxon. We also included the DNR organic cores that we had separated out earlier. For the alluvial and water taxons, we relied on remote sensing using aerial photography to verify accuracy. This slide shows the result of our accuracy assessment, our final accuracy assessment. Again, some of these classes that may appear to be performing poorly were still retained due to significance of interpretations and ratings and due to their high degree of variability across the landscape. Satisfied with our final accuracy assessment and correlation decisions, we hardened our raster map one last time. So for, de for developing our Sergo product, we actually used our finalized raster product to project our Sergo lines. Our first cut at putting lines on the map was by using the most important soil line, which was the hydric line. Our next step was determining what our most important classification was. The two boxes on the bottom left show how we grouped our classifications in a stepwise fashion. With our individual classifications grouped out, 
we regroup them based on our major breaks. After being regrouped, iterative, iterative eliminations were performed based on designated minimum acreage breaks. These acreage breaks were determined by reviewing the average acre size of how these groups were historically mapped. Once the circle lines were projected, the raster data within the projected circular delineations were aggregate, aggregated within each individual delineation. This gave us a percentage of raster model taxons within the projected strigo delineation that we can then use to determine percent composition, making the raster soil survey product truly complementary to the strigo product. This was just kind of a, a clip of the finished raster soil map with the strigo delineations overlaying on top. Now, we're all smart soil scientists, and we know that the soils here don't just stop having a thick silky mantle surface, which is designated by the hashtag mark or the hash mark, to not having that mantle. And knowing this, we developed the data to reflect this. The data behind these map units were developed to center around the central concept of that soil, but we also ensured that the ranges included the ability for those soils to have local variability of having, you know, the thicker surface, maybe the thinner surface, because we know that's how they actually exist on the landscape. All right, so hopefully everybody is still kind of with me right now because we're kind of going to take a slight turn and away from the spatial data and talk a little about, a bit about populating the database. So using the aggregated raster data within each Drigo delineation and determining the percentage of taxon, or, excuse me, determining the composition, um, we can do that in a data-driven method. So these box and whisker graphs show the percent composition of taxon within these two particular data map units. Now the whiskers on these two um, have been adjusted to show the 10th and 90th percentile as that is what we chose to represent our low and high values for data population and masses. Now again, I didn't use, well, we didn't use these uh, numbers as hard and fast. We just used them as a way to kind of, uh, to um, as a starting point of how we wanted to kind of attack this. Um, we also kind of followed the same method for populating horizon depth as well as diagnostic depth. Another set of data that we were fortunate to have was water table data from a nest of physometers that we installed in November of 2017. These wells had hobo wear installed um, that took two readings per day. Uh, and these were also installed on soils that were re representative of the entire project area, dense, coarse loamy alpha soils with episaturation. Using the data collected from these wells, along with precipitation data from a nearby weather station, we were able to use this information to populate the database, which gives our data more scientific integrity. So on that note, for this project, not only did we use digital soil mapping techniques to create a seamless, high-resolution raster product, in addition to producing a truly complementary struggle product um, in both an MLRA update and an initial soil survey area, it gave us the opportunity to address data integrity issues across a geomorphic surface, thus creating a soil, a soil survey product that not only used the latest available technology at a user-needed scale, but also truly harmonizes the raster product with the Strigo product and has the soil data populated to meet data integrity standards. Um, and on the very bottom here, I have um, a link, or an example on here is where you can access some of our um, process documents for the raster soil surveys that we have completed in Minnesota as well as in the handout pod. You should be able to access the HTML document, which is a user-friendly document, as I might, as I might say. Um, so awesome, we have this product. Sweet, cool. How do we get to it? Well, right now, it's not made live. It's there. It's waiting. It's, just, it's waiting to get pushed out. But once it is, if you go to the NRCS um, Gridded National Soil Survey page here that I have, and you click on download, you can download the raster soil survey if your state has any. Again, once this is, is made live for Minnesota, you can check it out. Um, so you find your state, and on the box on the far right where it says number two, you can download it, and you can bring it into your project. 
And so there's a, let me go back. So you also can download a toolbox that you bring into ArcMap where you can actually design and create the interpretation and ratings that you would do in Web Soil Survey. And the raster product isn't going to be available in Web Soil Survey. You would have to go through GNASCO and download it that way. So once you download it and you download the, uh, the uh, tool, you can go in ArcMap and you can create interpretive maps using the raster soil survey. Now, I didn't spend a whole lot of time making these three images here. It's just kind of a quick down and dirty way that you can see. So this top left image is the hydric ratings per map unit, and the black would be our circle delineations, and inside it is the raster. So you can look at these circle delineations, and you can look inside and see where these soils actually exist within that delineation as just a way to kind of see what's out there before you go out there. So I recommend, you know, any planners using this to go out there and verify, but it's just one tool in your toolbox that can help you. Um, do we have, I guess that uh, this is where the documentation is for you to access all of the process documents, the correlation documents. Um, again, I said they're, they're user-friendly HTML format. Um, I highly recommend you go and check it out. You can see the how we laid this project out, how we did it, how we came up with um, all the data that we used. And it's just, it's, uh, it's a very good tool to have. All right, any questions? Well, thank you, Betsy. And I'll just remind people to go ahead and put questions in the Q&A, or if they happen to show up in the chat, I'll try to catch those as, as well. And there's a, a question from Nick. Will this presentation be available for download as a PDF or PowerPoint file for reference? Yes, uh, those are found on our National Soil Survey Center videos and webinars page. And the recording of this webinar will also be available on our Soil Survey Center YouTube channel. All right, another question has come in from Charles. May I ask, for this MLRA project, how much time was projected toward the completion of the project? And can you give us an idea of personal invo personnel involved and how the labor was distributed toward completion of the milestones? All right. Um, so we had uh, designated two years to get this project done. And we resorted to using any available staff that we could get our hands on. We um, contacted soil survey offices that were nearby and asked for assistance, and we had um, sampling plans developed and in place so that we could assign points to um, the soil offices um, so they had something to follow and so that was less work on their part. So all they had to do was go out, um, record the, the observations, and we would go and enter it in, and that's uh, kind of how we approached that. All right, next question is from John. On one of those last slides, you were demonstrating how the raster and vector products look with a generated soil interpretation. How would you explain the difference in results between the vector and raster map to a non-soil scientist? Wish I would, uh, wish I would have included the beforehand. Um, so when we do these interpretations based on just the surgo, you are getting the interpretative interpretations and ratings based on the dominant component of that entire delineation. Whereas when you run it on the raster, you are getting the interpretive rating for that specific soil that's being mapped on the raster. So instead of getting one you know, good, bad, potentially OK rating, you're getting these ratings individually in that delineation based off where those components happen to be. And Andrea asks, can you discuss how you removed bad data or points you didn't include in the modeling process? Well, we looked at all the, the where the points were located, you know, the historical ones that were at NASA's, um, and we compared it to um, being on the LIDAR. I looked at old photography um, as close to that year as I could get. And if it looked like it occurred um, in the map unit that it was being described in, on the landscape it was being described in, on the slope it was being described in, that was a point to be used. If it came back looking at it as a point that we did not want to include, 
we did not tag it in NASIS as being part of the project, and we didn't use it for the spatial aspect of the project. We did, we would kind of use the data in our, you know, just reading it and, you know, add it to our knowledge, but it wasn't used for model training. And another question, did you update the ecological site information? Ah, that is a good question. Um, that is not one that I can answer right now, but I can certainly get back to you on that one, whoever asked, whoever asked that one. Unfortunately, they just logged in as guest too, so we're not sure. Okay. Uh, another question from Caitlin. <clears throat> can you expand on how you chose to break up your condition Latin hypertube sampling point categories, and why did you have three different categories? All right, well, we had two different categories. Um, let me back up here. And we ran it on the two different land uses, uh, agricultural land use and wooded land use. And we looked through all the historical documentation of where the historical pedons were, and dominantly the historical pedons occurred in agricultural land. As you can see on this slide, there were 70%, and 30% were in the wooded forested uh, land use. So what we did is then if we wanted to select you know, 40 points for to run in CLHS is we just kind of reverse the ratio so that we could create a balanced uh, data collection set to at least have representative representative numbers for both land uses. So one wasn't overweighting the other. And there's another question: uh, What product is going to be available to the conservation planners, raster or vector products? Both. Sergo is going to be is in um, web solo survey right now. The the product um, raster will be available on the um, geodata gateway as soon as that's made live, and they'll be able to pull that into ArcMap and use it as they can and see fit then. Uh, I'll also add a, a little bit to that. Um, we are being told that the uh, next version of CART will be ingesting raster data, so. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to test out some of this data um, in that setting as well. And sort of a follow-up question to that one is, how does the conservation planner on site validate the accuracy of your data? For instance, most of your accuracy falls between 30 and 70 percent, which is not bad for soil survey work, but is there a way for the user to find out if they're on the correct raster pixel, and if not, how do they figure out what they are on? How do we do it with Sergo data? Do, do they dig a hole? Does somebody look at it? I, I don't know. That would be my guess is how, how that's done. I would assume that uh, we would do the same process no matter what kind of soil map we're, we're using. Right. I, 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 would, I would hope they're still going out there and, you know, doing some sort of a, a hole, whether it's just a quick one or a back saver of some sort to at least verify that what they're planning to do is occurring on the soil that they're planning to do it on. I think traditionally, you know, it's the component is described where it is on the landscape, and so they know if they're, you know, on a foot slope or whatnot, uh, it'd be tied to that particular component. Right, and that'll still be the case. Um, for the vector product, it's still going to say where on the landscape that component occurs. Just on the raster, it's going to be actually visually mapped on that particular landscape position. Right. And again, I mean, you know, maps are models, whether you're doing it with a polygon or a, a square polygon that is a pixel. and. Um, none of our mapping is site specific, and so you know there should always be that caveat that uh, if you're looking at something site specific, then there should be some kind of verification of of what you're standing on. It keeps resizing my uh, window here; makes it hard for me. So Matt asks. Were the breaks between your different parent materials maintained as hard breaks in the raster data? since you use polygon parent material maps to separate them? Um, no, we didn't. I'm trying to see how I can word this. Um, 
You know what, um, let me email him back specifically on that one so I don't uh, mismatch what I'm trying to say. And the last question I see is just a follow-up to the uh, Sergo data we've been talking about. And if the Sergo data in the area is 1 to 36,000, uh, so there is no implication of that much accuracy, I guess, compared to the raster product. It's 1 to 36,000? No, in our area oh, it's uh, That's not a scale I'm, I'm familiar with for Sergo data. Now that's what they say it is in their area. But anyway, can you speak to the accuracy of different scales? And, uh, you know, I guess it, interpreting what they may be thinking is um, the ability in GIS to zoom in to a scale greater than what the mapping was produced at? Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, that ability exists and people are going to do it. It's sort of like natural human nature to want to zoom in and see things more clearly. But um, just like we have the uh, that warning, that caveat with our Sergo data, you know, at Web Soul Survey, if you zoom in too far, you get that nice little warning message. Doesn't mean that people aren't going to do it, um, but it's just important for us to communicate whether it's a raster soil survey product or a Sergo vector product that, you know, at some point you, you have gone beyond the appropriate um, scale for the data. And, you know, with the raster soil surveys, we have things like accuracy and uh, uncertainty that we can also uh, use to communicate the proper use of the data. Well, that has exhausted all the questions I see. Um, so with that, Thank you to Betsy for your time and effort to make this presentation, and thanks to all the participants for joining in. We hope you found this information beneficial. We had more than 100 people join today's webinar. As I mentioned earlier, a recording of this webinar will be available on our National Soil Survey Center YouTube channel within a few days. So feel free to let your colleagues know about this training opportunity. This concludes our webinar presentations.